I want to welcome everybody to the Engaging Those Who Need Recreation Most webinar. This webinar, again, was uh, very interesting for me to put together because I think this is such an important topic. Um, I'd like to start with a prayer, as we don't have an elder, and uh, to give thanks for uh, being able to give this webinar on Algonquin territory where I'm, I'm presently at. And I'd like to acknowledge all the territories of the people who are listening, whether it is live or uh, in the recording. I, I pray that um, everyone gets the information that they need today and uh, can put it into action to help their communities and uh, some of the youth that need it the most, and, and even the adults too. We are going to concentrate on youth today, uh, but it, all of this can be applied to adults if you just um, modify it a little bit. So I, I give thanks for this. I give thanks for the privilege of being able to, to deliver these webinars um, and hopefully affect positive change across Turtle Island and perhaps beyond. So. Uh, my name is Isabel Obey, and I'm president and founder of Native Way Training Services. We're a national business who specialize in creating, adapting, and delivering sport, recreation, and health information to Aboriginal people across Turtle Island. We also uh, created and delivered the Aboriginal Community Warrior, which is an Aboriginal fitness certification course that we're giving across Canada over the, the next year. Our next course is in Edmonton in June, and then we're in Mistissini in Quebec. Uh, then we head over to Clem 2 BC and then go back to Manitoba um, and there are more dates to be announced. So if you need some more information, you can contact me um, at, at Facebook that's uh, on the, the webinar right there on the page or at info at nativewaytrainingservices.com. So to put together these webinars, we've partnered with a few different organizations, and one of them is uh, the Leisure Information Network. I would like to invite Agnes Croxford to give us a, a, a brief introduction of their role in this project. Agnes? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm with the Leisure Information Network. We're a national nonprofit organization that um, provides information to uh, recreation practitioners through the internet, through an extensive website, um, a listserv, and we are the home of the National Recreation Database. Our role in this project is to host these webinars. Uh, so we provide all the technical backup for Isabel. And um, I will also be doing a tour of the Northern Links website, which we redeveloped for this project uh, at the end of the, uh, of the webinar. Uh, I just want to mention in that regard, for any of you who are not staying on the line for the tour, that the Northern Links website is a grassroots kind of website where we rely on you to let us know what resources you might have to share and what um, uh, programs you're running that are successful that you might be willing to share with other uh, users of the website. So I'm going to put my email address in the chat area if you have anything you'd like to contribute. And um, I'll talk with the rest of you later uh, after the webinar. Excellent. Thank you, Agnes. I'd also like to invite uh, Colin from Queen's University. I've been working with Queen's University for the past couple of years, and it's been a privilege um, as they're very uh, efficient at uh, gathering some of the information. Colin, if you could just give us a brief introduction on, on your role in this project. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Colin Bailey, and I'm from Queen's University. Uh, so Queen's University has been involved uh, just putting together an evaluation that follows each of these webinars. Um, and it's essentially a continuation of the Everybody Gets to Play Toolkit workshop, if you had been a part of that. If you aren't familiar with the workshop, uh, for the webinars in particular, we simply just want to know if this is a, a good way of providing people with information. Um, if you did agree to participate, we really appreciate that. Each uh, evaluation uh, following each webinar takes only about five minutes to complete, um, and you get a chance to win a $25 gift certificate. And uh, if you do fill those out, we really appreciate it. And I will add my contact information if anyone has any questions to the chat area as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Colin. And last but not least, uh, I will speak for CPRA. I've been working with CPRA for the past couple of years, and it's been a very good learning experience for me. They're very supportive. Um, a little bit about them. CPRA exists to build healthy communities and enhance the quality of life and environments of all Canadians through collaboration with their partners. As Colin mentioned, these webinars are a, an add-on or a build-up 
or build an, an addition to the Everybody Gets to Play workshops that we delivered across Canada. And uh, it was mostly for community recreation workers. However, we had all different levels of uh, decision makers and organizations. Um, these webinars are an addition to help uh, promote and support community workers and decision makers in uh, their very important work. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Pelche. She's the one who is helping us with all the technical start stuff here. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, so as Isabel said, I'm here for technical support. So I work with the Leisure Information Network, and, um, and I host and, and take care of all the background stuff when it comes to these uh, on-site online webinars. So um, just a few notes as we go on. If you lose a connection, there's any interruptions whatsoever, your audio uh, for whatever reason isn't working, please send me an email. You'll see it in the chat. Um, it's jpeltier at lynn.ca. And, um, and just uh, for your phone lines, as a note, that uh, if you'd like to contribute anything over the phone lines and you need to unmute your lines, you can push pound six on your phone. And to mute your lines, all you'd have to do is push star six. And that's it. Back to you, Isabel. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So today's goal uh, for the webinar is our identifying the youth that need these programs, identifying the barriers, enumerating the benefits of these different programs, and tips on how to get them involved. We also have a couple of ideas of programs. Before I get started, though, I'd like to mention how all of these webinars, well, all the topics came to be. I had some uh, co consultations with approximately 30 Aboriginal community wor workers or organizations that work with Aboriginal people. And uh, we had some conversations. I had a questionnaire with various questions um, asking them what would help them most. And these, this topic came up because, um, and even when we were giving the workshops across Canada, the Everybody Gets to Play, this topic came up very often, how to get the people who need it the most, because it's easy to engage the people who are already active, who are already engaged, and, and who are speaking to uh, the community and you know, different levels of the community. Um, but there are some that are off the radar, and uh, we need to be able to help them with all the statistics that we have that are happening. Um, one of the communities that uh, I heard recently lost 14 youth in the past year. And this is one of the communities that would benefit probably from this webinar. And uh, it's who I had in mind when I was gathering the information and, and um, speaking to a few of my colleagues on, on how they got people involved in their community. So I hopefully um, I've targeted some of the issues and, and presented some solutions in a way that can be applied easily. And if not, I do want to reach out and uh, let people know that they can contact me directly for any support or help or ideas. Um, I'm always available because this, uh, this is our future. They're our youth. So the format of the session, uh, there will be delivery of information with some questions asked through polls. We might be sending them after the webinar evaluation after the information session. We want to know if you found this information valuable. There will be an open discussion and sharing with participants. This is an opportunity for all of us to share some of our solutions or some of our problems. And um, even if you, there was something that you enjoyed about the, um, the webinar or something that you'd like to add, it's a great time for us to, to network and to support each other. There will be some last poll questions evaluating the exchange. And as Agnes had mentioned, a brief tour of the Northern Links website and all of its valuable resources. Before we get started, we're going to highlight a couple of the physical activity guidelines that we find at uh, ccep.ca. I would note that website and go back to it pretty often because we have been highlighting the guidelines, but it's a great resource to have. So, Youth are engaged to limit sedentary behaviors to no more than two hours daily and to participate in physical activities that support natural development and are enjoyable and safe. Following these guidelines can improve body composition, cardiorespiratory and muscular skeletal fitness, academic achievement, self-esteem, and social behaviors. The benefits of reduced sedentary time far exceed the potential risks. These guidelines may be appropriate for use with a disability or medical condition. However, their parents or caregivers should consult a health professional to understand the types or amounts of activities appropriate to them. 
youth should accumulate 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity daily. This includes both cardiovascular and strength training activity at least three times a week. No one can argue about the importance of physical activity in our communities. Suicide and self-inflicted injuries are the leading causes of First Nations death for youth up to 44 years of age. Suicide rates for the Inuit youth are among the highest in the world at 11 times the national average. Physical activity is one of the best ways to counteract many of our social issues in Aboriginal communities today. It is accessible to use right now as all we need are our bodies and the benefits can be immediate as well. If we sit back, and I think I mentioned this in another webinar, if we actually think about people and their behaviors, the only thing that anybody is ever looking for is to feel good. It doesn't matter how they try, whatever their behavior, that's what they're looking for. Whether they're angry and they act out, they're looking for that release. Um, if they're hungry, they're going to eat. It's just, it's simple, it's a simple concept. So when we think about the youth in our communities and how they're acting, um, we have to keep that in mind. They're looking to feel good and our job as supportive community workers or organizations are to provide that outlet in a way that they will find it um, accessible and safe and easy to engage in. And this is what this webinar is about. Furthermore, physical activity has been an integral part of Aboriginal cultures since the beginning of time. Our ancestors knew they needed to be fit and healthy to survive the environmental conditions of the land they lived on. Oftentimes when I'm giving a, web, uh, a workshop, I will uh, highlight, I'll, I'll play a video of the Inuit games because most of these games were based on um, just basic survival skills that they needed. Uh, the, I don't know if you've ever seen it. If not, I, I would uh, highly recommend that you Google the Arctic Games and YouTube. And uh, you might see there's one activity where they're on their knees and they swing their arms and they have to jump up and land on their feet as far as they can. So just to give you a quick background on that exercise or, or that activity, this was used when they were hunting seals. They would actually um, cut the holes in the ice and they would bait the hole. And they knew that if they stood near the hole that the, the seal would either smell them or see them and wouldn't come. So they had to put them you know, back up as far as they could go and have their lance ready. And as soon as that seal would come up to eat that bait, then they would jump and they would, they would uh, hunt the seal. So I'm not promoting uh, seal hunting at all. I'm <laughs> just explaining the background of that activity. But this is something that was used in every nation in different ways. Whenever we had physical activity, it was to prepare them for uh, hunting or just survival on the land. Um, the other way that physical activity was used was to uh, resolve some conflicts. So some of the elders would um, go into um, a meeting, for lack of a better word, and uh, they wouldn't come out until they had agreed upon a challenge for whoever was in an argument, whether it was two people or a nation, and uh, then they would present the challenge, and whoever won the challenge, then that they won whatever disagreement that there was. So this is something that, that has been there since the beginning of time, and we absolutely need to bring it back and uh, reflect modern times with some of the ancient knowledge that uh, was part of the culture. So some of our youth today are feeling the results of years of poor societal conditions, lack of opportunities in remote communities, and the residual effects of the residential school era. All of these can cause anxiety, negative self-talk, destructive behavior, substance abuse. If we don't intervene, our youth can internalize these feelings and will act withdrawn, shy, and demonstrate self-inflicting behaviors that can escalate, such as cutting, eating disorders, substance abuse, and the worst one of all is the suicide. So what are the barriers that some of these kids are facing? Some of them have changing life situations, whether it's foster care, separation, substance abuse at home. Some of them have to help at home with the family situation, single mothers who have to work, um, so the kids have to help with the younger kids. Some of them have lack of self-confidence, social skills. They feel like they don't belong. And some of them have physical barriers like transportation. I've seen that one a lot as I was uh, working in remote communities. 
Some of them have lack of financial means, no parental support, social alienation and bullying. And what I mean by social alienation, sometimes, as we know, in communities, a certain family can be known as um, the family who has negative characteristics. And so they get pigeonholed in that role. And the kids that are coming up, whether they want to do something different, they are still feeling that pigeonhole. And so sometimes we're limiting them just by the way that we treat them or we see them. And they feel it. They absolutely feel it. Some of them have a learning disability. So what can we do together? Well, I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to identify who these youth are. And there are several ways that we can do this because they often fall under the radar. When, especially as community workers, and I'm going to tell you a quick personal story. Um, I was hired to do some Aboriginal sport in a youth camp. And uh, there was one young boy who was a little bit heavier than the others. And he didn't feel uh, comfortable doing the physical activity um, that I, I had prepared. And I remember noticing that, but I, I had like a big group of kids that I had to take care of, but I, I, I noticed that he was there. And after the event was done, that boy went and sat in his grandmother's truck. And uh, so I, I walked by and, uh, you know, I started talking to him. And he was shocked that I actually took the time to speak to him. And he actually, it was kind of funny because I, I spoke to him and, and you know, I said, so you didn't like the, the games that we were playing today. I noticed that you weren't uh, participating. And he, he just said no. And I could see that he was shocked. And I said, you know, I'd really like it. I'm back tomorrow. I'd really like it if you came and participated tomorrow. And he just kind of nodded very quickly. But you could see he was uncomfortable with just the attention that I gave him. And he rolled up his window <laughs> as I walked away. And I thought, okay. So the next day what I did was I made sure to uh, say hello to him. And he sat um, on the sidelines again. And uh, then I went and sat beside him. Like I had, I had some assistants working with me, and I had told them about this, this boy. And I went and sat beside him, and I said, you know, um, do you want to come play? And he's like, no, I don't like this game. I said, okay, well, what game do you like? And so he said a certain game. I said, okay, great. So we're going to do that right now. And so I pulled him up. And I had him come over, and I stopped the activity, and I said, okay, now we're going to do this. And um, so he participated, and it was great. And then the next time that, um, like there was a leader in this game, the next time that we were supposed to have a, a different leader, he volunteered right away. So that didn't take a long time. It just took uh, a couple of minutes of me sitting down with him and acknowledging him and finding out what he wanted and then providing it to him. And uh, that made a big difference. And he participated from that day on in the, the activities. So that, you know, it's just a simple thing that we can do. So observe the youth, ask teachers, community members, and the health center to find out who they are, because oftentimes you won't see them out. So once you find out who they are, find out what their interests are, either directly or indirectly. Indi and what I mean by that, directly was like what I did. I sat down and asked him what he liked. Indirectly would be to work with the teacher and either put together a questionnaire a very simple one saying what their favorite music is, what their favorite video game is, um, you know, just a brief profile to find out. And you give it to all the kids, not just the ones that you're trying to get. So you can see generally what people are, are interested in. And then you use that to build whatever um, initiative that you want to do. Um, the other thing I'm going to mention right away is that we have a tendency to think of programs. And when we're dealing with these kids who aren't used to uh, being social and um, participating in different things, I think it's easier to, to present an event a short amount of time to them, whether it's an hour or a couple of hours or a full day, um, because there's no commitment, there's less risk for them, because that's basically how they live their lives. Um, if they're under the radar and they're not used to participating, the first thing that they're going to be evaluating is, what's the risk to me? Uh, you know, whether it will be social alienation or lack of success. So we have to present things in a way that they'll be comfortable in going in and they'll see as safe. So using strategy. To engage youth who don't usually participate, you need to work on two levels, the emotional and the intellectual. And I'll tell you why. I left out the physical because some of these kids don't have the physical um, development that others have or don't have the confidence. They, they might actually have the ability, but they don't have the confidence. Um, absolutely, I would uh, integrate some physical activity in that, keep it simple, and make sure that you set them up for success. But these are the two that I would think of before, it's the emotional and the intellectual. And for the emotional strategy, we need to make them feel welcomed. 
that we accept them as they are and that they matter. It's very simple. The next, next thing we must ensure is that they are safe from ridicule, ridicule or of feeling left out. So the way that we can do that is we can set group rules right from the beginning. And I always do that when I'm working with people, uh, whether they're adult or youth. Um, you know, we speak respectfully. And then you have to give an example of what that is and say there's no name calling. There's no um, bullying. Um, everybody works together, and we help each other out. Um, I'm just giving you a quick example, but that's basically what I, I would outline a few rules uh, depending on the situation. So we want to acknowledge their successes without making a big deal out of it. Some of these kids are shy, as I mentioned earlier. So you don't want to put them in the spotlight because they've been avoiding it consistently. So you can actually go near them afterwards and kind of speak to them and say, you know, good job, you did great, you know, I'm really proud of you. And uh, I'm a Cub Scout leader, so I use this with some of the kids who don't um, participate as much, and they appreciate that because they feel seen uh, without being embarrassed. The intellectual strategy, it's important to get them curious about what you're doing and make the focus, focus on the activity and not on social integration. So that's where your homework comes in handy because you've already scoped out the land and figured out what they're interested in. And obviously, you're going to want to know uh, what the kids that you specifically want to target are interested in. And um, so to get them curious, you know, you can take so many different approaches. I was looking online for different um, websites, and you know, there's some very cool, very simple, low-budget science projects that the kids can do, like a wind catcher, uh, and how to generate energy with the, there was another thing, I, I didn't uh, spend the time looking at it too much, but this is something that we need to do. Figure out cool, different, easy things that we can present to them. You want to make sure that you incorporate as many of their interests as possible to keep them engaged. Now, one of the games that's very popular, and it may have changed from one week to another, is Assassin's Creed. And uh, I'm not promoting that we, um, we encourage any killing. That's not the thing. Uh, in that particular game, what happens is they, there are all kinds of different parkour activities where uh, the main characters will be jumping and, and leaping and doing all kinds of different activities. So what you can do is you can use that name and say, I have an Assassin's Creed um, uh, obstacle course for you and you know make it interesting have it a little bit like a treasure hunt and put it together so just the fact that you're uh, using a word a name that they're familiar with and that they like they respect and they enjoy right there you're associating your program with the same kind of feelings so these are simple little strategies that you can use you want to keep it interesting by introducing new concepts regularly. So you don't just stay on one concept. You, you know, incorporate um, some of the, the traditional games, the science, uh, crafts, uh, get the elders involved with storytelling. You, know, just, you make it as varied as possible. Have them lead some activities, and, and then you lead others. Um, keep it interactive. You also want to give them a role or a responsibility so that they feel important. Some of these kids who act out a lot, and um, as I mentioned in the Cub Scouts, there, I have one youth who, uh, who has ADD, ADHD, and um, most of the Cub, leaders, uh, Cub Scout leaders have a hard time with him. I love him <laughs> because he's very, very smart. Um, so I, you know, I've made him my, my personal project in the sense that um, I, you know, I work with him, but, but I've got experience with that, so I'm very comfortable with it. And basically, I give him a job. I have him help me with different things. And when it comes to physical activity, or it, it depends, and it's not just physical activity, I'll say, wow, you know, I'm sure you're going to be very good at this. And as soon as I say that, he, he steps up, and then he, he'll do it. And he actually helped other kids with it. So that doesn't take a lot of uh, effort on my, role, on my part. So giving them a responsibility and a part um, in the, either the organization or um, after to clean up or to help out with other things is incredibly beneficial. So respect their level of ability, whether it be for physical activity or even learning ability. Um, there again, it's important that we do our, our homework to find out what uh, areas they're having issues with. And that's with the teachers and, and the parents maybe. Um, and then set, your pro set them up for success by making sure that you maybe avoid or you modify certain parts of your program or activity. So you want to set them up for success 
and for a challenge as we build confidence by achieving things that we work at. And this is very important because um, oftentimes we, we can give handouts to people. And, um, and I'm sure everybody on this call can relate. When you work for something, um, you appreciate it that much more, and it does build confidence. So we have to set them up for success, as is written right there, but we also have to build their confidence by making sure that they work for it and they feel like they, they pushed out of their comfort zone just a little bit um, and that we're right there to, to support them through it if they you know, have a snag or have a challenge. That's probably the, the most important part. They're, these kids are usually looking for somebody to reach out to, although they won't act that way. But when they get it, that's when the transformation happens. You want to build social skills in your activities. So you want to integrate problem-solving skills. You want to have them do group and individual activities and scope them out uh, for the percentage of the group and the individual activities. If you have a group um, who works really well together, then you can do more things as a group. If you have some kids that are really having a hard time, you can still have them do group activities, uh, but break them up into small groups. So instead of having six people together, you can have two or three. And uh, so they'll feel a lot safer in that. And that's actually um, in one of the facilitator trainings that uh, I took, it was something that they highlighted, uh, especially to, to build group dynamics. Instead of having everybody speak in front of the whole group right in the beginning, you, you want to start building relations slowly. So you have them do individual work first, and then you have them paired with two and three, and then you gauge to see how they're doing, and then you can increase it. Or you can go from one to the other as well. You really need to observe and then trust your intuition on that. The other thing you want to do is you want them to use different types of communication. So some people are more visual, some are verbal, and, and some of them are more kinesthetic. So you can introduce different ways of them communicating with each other. Like say uh, they have to guide somebody but they're not allowed to speak or they have to communicate kind of like charades. Um, and, and just even with writing, with drawing, one of the activities that I did before was I would give every group a sentence and they had to draw it out. They weren't allowed to use letters or numbers. And they had to draw out the sentence. And their group had to guess what it was. And so you know, you'd have all kinds of really cool drawings and, and you know, a lot of laughter. And uh, it helped them communicate with each other. And it created a bond with them. And um, you know, it, just, it was fun, which is the most important thing. You want to give conflict resolution pointers as well. So if they're having a hard time making decisions, then you tell them, OK, this is, you, you can do two things. You can either vote or you can uh, have a discussion and uh, take your time and see, hear everybody's point of view and then make a decision as a group. You can use cultural teachings to get points across as well. And that would include the circle. Um, or have the elder come in and uh, talk to them, tell them a story and you know, give them some of the teachings on uh, their role as youth right now. We have the seventh generation prophecy that is happening. And uh, you know, the youth today are very, very important to us. Um, and so if you have somebody who tells them a, te a teaching or a story that goes with that, then they're going to relate to that. And you know, you're going to build your, their confidence in a different way as well. Most importantly, whenever you are planning any kind of activity, you want to make it cool, you want to make it fun, and you want to make it even more fun. Because the kids, they don't care about anything else but that at that point in time. They want to feel good, um, just like everybody else does. But it, I think it's more prevalent at that age because they're able to play and to do stuff. But, you know, they've been given that permission um, because of their age. And um, you know, this is actually a lesson for us as well, because whatever we do, we should be making it fun and cool and more fun. Um, there's no reason why all the work that we do can't be fun. You know, we can still get a lot done and enjoy it at the same time. And what's going to happen with that is the kids are going to going to want to be around us more as well, because they, you know, who doesn't want to be around somebody who's fun? Everybody. So some of the points to consider: uh, you want to make activities quick and clear. When you're giving explanations, you don't want them to last 15 minutes and then the activity is five minutes. You want to make sure that they get um, the information that they need. So you can use a few different ways to do that. Either you can write them down um, and then you know, have them refer to them, um, or you can just tell them very quickly and then be there for further 
information, you can break it down in steps. You can say, okay, uh, I want you to do this, that, and the other thing, and you have 10 minutes to do it. When you're done, come see me. I'll give you the next step. You know, there's so many different ways to do that. But if you're talking for a long period of time, they're going to tune out. They're going to start bugging each other, and, and you're going to lose them. You want to give them a voice. Um, if it's a new group and they're kind of timid or shy, I think the best way to do that is you give them choices. So whether it be for an activity or for snacks or for you can say, you can either have this or you can have that. What do you choose? Um, if you just let them um, have free choice without any guidance and it's not a group that has gelled yet or has created uh, some kind of um, bond between each other, you might have arguments, you might have nothing getting done. So it's always best to, to give them uh, a guided type of uh, decision-making process. And that leads into my next point, which it teaches them how to make decisions. And I mentioned before, they can vote, they can have a circle, um, you know, they can have a, a committee for certain decisions. There's so many different ways that we can teach them how to do this. And it, it's very important. This is a skill they're going to carry out throughout their lives. And it, it's probably part of their lack of self-confidence is they may have made a bad decision uh, somewhere along the line, and being more sensitive, they decided to hide in their shell after. So if we start giving them um, direction on how to make decisions, then actually, you know, this is something that might benefit them in their career choices, their social life, um, and just in life in general. You want to emphasize good leadership. So if somebody is doing something well, um, I'm working with a group right now that uh, took my Aboriginal Community Warrior course, and uh, the, I'm so impressed by them because one of the ladies just took on the role of leadership and she's organizing, she's supporting others. So if we see that even in a very small way with the kids, um, like that, uh, that cub um, that I mentioned who has ADD, ADHD, at one point he supported one of his, um, other, the other cubs into something. And, and, you know, I went over to him and I said, wow, good job. You know, I'm really proud of you. You should have seen his face. He, he was so happy. Um, so this is very simple, but as soon as you see something good, emphasize it. We have a tendency to be negative or to, to focus on the, the negative sometimes. And, and it just, if we just switch that to the positive, um, it changes the group dynamics. You want to make sure your adult leaders are all on the same page. So make sure you have the same direction. There's nothing worse than leaders that are disgusting or arguing or you know trying to figure out what to do. Meantime, the youth are seeing this, and you have um, the big chance of losing them at that point. They need to feel s secure, and one of the ways to do that is by having very clear leadership and everybody supporting each other in their decisions. So you want to be clear, you want to have set guidelines, but you don't want to be rigid. You don't want to be too flexible as well, as I mentioned earlier. Um, if you don't give them direction, they, you'll lose them. Um, they, these are kids who need to be supported through stuff. They need to know that somebody is behind them and, and uh, won't criticize. And uh, so we have to teach them how to make decisions. We have to be clear in our leadership, but we also have to be flexible. And that's another good teaching to be giving them, as we know in our lives, and I'm sure everybody can agree, there are times where we need to be flexible and not make it about us. We always have to remember what the goal is, and the goal is um, to get these kids to be healthier and happier. So we need to be consistent as we're building trust with these kids. Even if one or two show up, do something with them. And I've seen this everywhere, where there aren't enough kids, so we're canceling the program. What we're essentially telling these kids is the ones who did show up, who are looking to reach out, that they're not important. And that's not okay. That, that really, that can destroy a person. And especially at that age where they don't have the skills to, to cope with things, and if it's some of the kids who are under the radar to begin with, um, you know, that's not a very good approach to have. And I understand we're guided by finances oftentimes, and it's return on investment. Um, but the investment that we put in by spending time with these kids who are looking to reach out will come back to us, and they'll come back to our community. So that's why we need to uh, continue these programs. And even if there are only two or three to begin with, chances are they will bring more kids later on. And um, so we have to be open to that. There, there's a process in reaching these kids. 
Um, you know, don't expect them all to jump on board right away. It might take a year. It might take two years. We don't know. But the thing is, this work needs to get done either way. So we need to be consistent. So we build trust by following through on what we said we would do and showing that we care. Um, I've had several conversations with people around me about this and, and uh, asking them about uh, you know, their lives. And, and uh, everyone spoke about their one key person that changed their lives or influenced their lives. And one person in particular was uh, a little bit combative, uh, was getting into fights very often. And that was their way of being in the world. That's what they knew. Um, that's what their family knew, and, and that's what their family did. So um, it took one teacher, a high school teacher, who confronted that kid and said, you're my project from now on. You're always getting into trouble. I'm going to change that. And of course, the youth <laughs> started arguing with that teacher and even got physical with the teacher. But that teacher never gave up. And to this day, this person is a successful professional. Um, they got involved in sport and did very well in sport and continue to. Um, but that's all it takes. It takes one person who shows that they care and that they're invested. Um, and we can change lives that way. And I'm sure everybody on this call can think of a moment in time where somebody, somebody's act of words or kindness influenced them. So have the kids, these are teaching collaboration. These are suggestions that we can use. So have the kids either get into a large canoe or carry a log together. So for the canoe activity, have them paddle out from the shore and then tell them that they need to get to a certain point, but that only one side of paddlers is allowed to row. After a few minutes, you switch the paddler side so it's only the other side that can row. So when you see that they're having fun or getting frustrated, you have them start paddling together towards the goal. So what's going to happen if it's only one side that's paddling? Well, they're going to go in circles. And same thing on the other side. So this is uh, basically to teach them that they need to work together and that every paddler is important, whether they're paddling hard or softly, um, whether they're good at it or not. To keep balance, we have to help each other out. And some people do need to work a little bit harder or um, guide things a little bit more. The person in the back has to guide the canoe um, more than the people in the front, right? But, um, so this is something, a, a quick activity where it's uh, learning by doing. So when they return, you ask them what they learned and uh, ask them how they felt. So what happened when the, the first side started paddling? What happened when the second side? Who was crabby? Who was supportive? Who, who worked the hardest? Who, who needed more uh, help? Um, and then how did it go when everybody worked together? And you know they might come out with some pretty cool things that uh, I, I find when I'm working with anybody, whether it's youth or adults, I learn as much as I teach. So you can do the same activity with a log or something large to carry. Have the youth carry both ends of the item a few feet and then tell them they need to reach a certain area. However, the people holding the front need to step away and only the back end can go forward and then have them switch and then work together. So obviously when you get the people holding the front walking away, um, the people in the back are going to struggle. They're, they're not allowed to change positions, so they're going to have to try to push the log, and obviously they're not going to get very far. And then when you have the other group, um, you have them do the same, um, go to the back, not to the front, because they can just drag it. Um, and uh, so that, that's another teaching um, activity. So teaching problem solving. So this is another suggestion. Uh, you can enlist some skill-savvy community members to help you. So you gather five items that are needed to create something. And this could be anything, um, but I'm going to give you one specific example. So for example, to build a fire, you can put five things, the flint, log, cloth, moss, small branches, and water together. And tell them that they can only pick three to start a fire, then they need to put it out. Um, obviously, you need to make sure that whoever is helping them out uh, knows how to start a fire with just these items. Whatever they bring by, they, they need to be able to do it. And you know, some of them might not choose the flint, uh, which would be a mistake, but that, that's also a learning opportunity for them. So you give them five minutes to decide as a team which items they will take back to their community helper. With the help and the, and the guidance of the community helper, they will accomplish their task within a set amount of time. So either they're going to make it or they're not. Uh, they might argue, which is all part of the teaching. Um, and then after, you can have a discussion about how it went. So obviously, you can have different stations with different things. 
So with this activity, they learn how to work with others, make group decisions, and learn a new skill, which all builds confidence while having fun. So conflicts may arise, and this will be the perfect time to have an elder teach conflict resolution through circles. I would actually start um, the group or the activity with an elder uh, and let them know what their role is. That you know, if there's an issue, if somebody doesn't feel right or um, has something that they want to talk about, that the elder will be there. Um, these kids really need to have support, and they might not feel comfortable going to the leader because the leader is dealing with everybody at all times. They might need to have somebody privately that they can speak to and trust. Um, again, you know, our role is to set them up for success and to kind of, um, you know, think of all the problems that could happen and what's important to the kids and give them, provide them a solution before the problem presents itself. So getting role models involved. Whether they are respected celebrities, athletes, or community leaders, we need to get others involved so that the youth are exposed to different people and activities. Looking up to someone is an important part of setting goals and building confidence. It may give them something to strive for. Um, another quick story, I was working in a certain community and, and this family um, was engaged in uh, criminal activities and they were known to be a certain way. And uh, so I was working with uh, some of the youth and and um, <clears throat> it was in a classroom setting. And I asked this uh, kid from, from that family, I said, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the first thing he said was what his family does. And I said, really? I said, well, what do you like doing? Like, what do you like doing in your free time? And he really liked cars and he liked different things. And so I said, wow, did you ever think about becoming a mechanic or, you know, restoring uh, antique cars? Or, and I'll never forget the look on his face because he had never even considered that he had other options and that he could do something else that he liked. Um, which comes back to what I mentioned earlier about being pigeonholed. Uh, we need to be careful that we don't set them, cast them in a certain role. We need to be able to show them that they have options, that you know, some of these remote communities, the kids don't see anything but their daily lives, and their daily lives might not be ideal. So we need to be able to show them that there's something else out there. Um, one of the things that I did in a leadership workshop was I showed um, um, a video of Crail Kielberger who created uh, Free the Children and how he started, I think he was nine when he started, I can't remember, it was, it's been a while since I watched the video, but I show these kids that this kid did this and now he's in his 20s or 30s and it's a huge organization. And when they see that, I, I see, you know, the thoughts that go in, in their mind and I make sure to tell them if the thought's not there, I tell them, that could be you, you could be that kid, um, you know, so they, we have to show them that there are opportunities and possibilities beyond what they see in their daily lives. So if the youth feel like they belong somewhere and begin to take pride in their culture, community, and their history, then they will be less likely to indulge in negative behavior. Um, I want to mention um, the missing and murdered women, and there are missing and murdered men as well. And when I hear about them, I always think, I wonder what could have been done to prevent that. And I think that we need to keep that in mind because our work, as little as it may be, um, makes a huge difference. I still get some people contacting me through Facebook you know, or whatever. They, some people it's in person, and they thank me for something I said or did. And I don't even remember that moment, but it made a difference to them. So as community workers or people who are invested in, in creating programs or, or helping uh, our communities get healthier, I think we need to be mindful of everything that we say and do and make sure that there's more positive than negative um, because we're affecting others and it's a huge responsibility. So it may take a bit more effort to get those who are usually on the sidelines and it will also make the biggest difference. Our extra effort with proper planning can save lives. So wishing you success in all of your endeavors. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to put my, um, my email down here. And if you ever have a question or uh, need some support or some ideas, I have a million ideas all the time, you can contact me. I'm more than willing to, to be there for you and, and uh, help you out in any way that I can. Um, so I want to thank you for taking this time to uh, listen to me. And I hope that you're inspired or got some, kind, some ideas that can help you in, in the work and so that you can influence health in communities. So miigwech.
Uh, our next webinar I'd like to invite you to is Integrating Culture into Recreation, which is May 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is our, the last of the series, but you can um, share the, the webinars with any of your colleagues or your friends if you go to northernlinks.org. Uh, they are recorded there. If you, um, I, I, There's a link that will bring you to uh, the page where they are. And you can even search on YouTube as well. They're there. Um, so I hope that uh, you'll come back for the next one and bring some of your friends, because the more people we have, the better it is, and you know, the more we can influence positive change. So miigwech to everybody, um, and thank you for listening. At the same time, we can uh, take this time to have uh, a group conversation. So if anybody has a comment, a question, or something that they liked about the webinar, you can unmute your line. I think it's... Uh, um, I can't remember. <laughs> Jennifer, what is it? for uh, to, unmute? Uh, to unmute the line is pound six. Pound six, OK. So if you do have a question, comment, or something appreciated, please feel free to do that. And uh, I'd love to hear from you. So in the meantime, I'm just going to write down my uh, email. So does anybody have anything to share or um, anything that they found helpful in the webinar? Please let me know or something else that you'd like to have, another resource. So it's pound six. The other thing that I'd like to say is uh, feel feel comfortable going on the, on the web, the internet, and Googling any kind of activities that you can uh, think of. Uh, there's so many really cool things that are out there that are low budget that you, you, know, you can use stuff that's in your kitchen or um, you can find in the woods. So don't hesitate to do some searches. There are so many different um, options that we have to do this that don't need to cost a lot of money. Okay, so I'm going to invite Agnes to uh, give us a brief tour of the nor northernlinks.org website. And uh, again, miigwetch for listening, and uh, I look forward to seeing you on the 21st. Agnes? Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, develop redevelopment of the Northernlinks <laughs> website was part of this project, and uh, it was funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada, so we're very grateful to them for the funding. I also want to express a very sincere appreciation to Bert Crowfoot, who made available most of the images that you see on the site. And they really are stunning. We've had many, many uh, compliments for, uh, about them. I want to also mention, uh, as I did at the beginning of the webinar, that this is a grassroots site. We need your input to tell us what uh, you'd like to see on the site and to help us add more resources and more program ideas to it. So as we go through the site, you will see uh, boxes on the, generally on the right-hand side of the page, which allow you to send us comments or provide input. Um, on the home page, you'll notice we have a feature section where we're, at the moment, we're promoting the uh, webinar series. And if you follow that link, it will take you to um, the recorded uh, web, uh, recordings of the webinars as well. So um, you can see past webinars where you can either watch the video or download the PowerPoint. And if you continue on down, um, you can see how you can register for upcoming webinars. We usually have the recordings on within a few days of the webinar, so you just need to check back um, in a few days if you want to share the recordings with anyone. Also on the home page, um, you can see what's being added to the website. Uh, it gets updated um, every week, almost every day. And you can see the latest event, success story, or program idea, um, news item, and resource that's been added um, on the home page every, every day. So some of the things that are available on the site, we have both news and events here. We have someone who actually goes through hundreds of uh, news sources every 
couple of days and adds in uh, items that would appear to be of use to you. Um, because we're aiming for people who are working or volunteering in recreation or physical activity promotion, health promotion, um, they, they won't likely be really local activities. They'll be uh, regional or provincial or national uh, items that you, could, that you should, should know about um, and that may be of some help to you in your work. So that's news items. Similarly for events, we have a list of, of events that are um, of, of interest and open to people working in recreation. We have um, a resource uh, database. This is a database of practical resources, things like um, procedures and forms you might be able to use, permission forms or checklists that kind of thing that would be helpful to you on your job. You can search by keyword, and you can select either uh, to receive only Aboriginal results or all results. Um, you can also search by topic. And each uh, spot where you see a little book icon indicates that you can find subtopics. So you could do a search either on, in this case, games and activities in general, or traditional games. And uh, I'm just going to show you what we have in terms of traditional games. So we have a, some items here that um, actually so include, include traditional games um, that you might want to try out in your community. We're very interested to add to this um, collection. So uh, if, if you have a traditional game that you can tell us about, Use the form to the, side, to the side to let us know that. We also have a database of program ideas or success stories. And uh, again, you can search by keyword or by the program setting. So if you're going to run the setting in a school or the, the program in a school, for example, you would be able to search and find resource uh, program ideas that are appropriate to run in a school. Um, just because we're talking about youth today, I'm going to um, just use youth as my keyword and see. Nobody there? OK. Um, so uh, sorry, I was interrupted there for a moment. So you can see that we have um, a number of of programs that are um, appropriate for youth. Um, we also have a listing of funding sources. And these are by no means uh, comprehensive, but when we hear about a new fund um, that might be available to you, we let you know. And finally, I just want to mention to you the listserv. Um, the Sharing Circle Listserv is avail available for you to subscribe to, and I urge you to, join, to do that, to join. Um, it provides two things for you. First of all, uh, we'll send out updates about what's new on the website, and in particular, if any new funding sources come up. And you also have the opportunity to ask other people on the Listserv for help uh, or guidance or suggestions. So um, I encourage you to, to um, join the listserv and to come back and um, explore the website um, in, in more detail. And um, that's about it for now. So I'm going to turn it back over to Isabel. Well, thank you so much, Agnes. And I really invite people to explore this website because there's so many great things that are on there and to contribute as well. Um, so I, I want to thank everyone and uh, invite you to come to the next one on May 21st, and I hope to see you there. So miigwech and, and uh, be well. Bye.